regarding the efficiency of um, your product, can you still run NTT number of the value transform? Yes, yes. Um, My question. Yes, so um, we can do similar NTT based uh, fast arithmetic on middle product, similar to what we do in real or nominal. Yeah, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll mention it briefly in my next talk. Does it have worse case to average the case of uh, reduction or the reduction? Yeah, so it had, uh, so what we showed is that uh, MPLWE is as hard as PLWE mod F. And there are already known the worst case reductions uh, reducing the um, worst case problems to PLW mod F. So, so you can combine these two to get the worst case reductions for PLW, but it will be with respect to, to kind of uh, ideal lattices or module lattices. Yeah. So, but that's a good question because we don't know. Maybe there is a, another class of uh, worst case lattices that we can directly reduce to a PLWE. That would be quite interesting, yeah. Okay, let's have a 10 minutes break. Uh, <laughs> the second talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the applications of the third talk for this little product of the new problem and, and it's a cis counterpart, it's cis now. So, um, <coughs> so the main uh, applications <coughs> we'll be looking at are these two. So we'll first start uh, with public key encryption uh, and how we we constructed for MPLWE, and we'll have a look at uh, two constructions. One is uh, of the primal regif type of encryption scheme, uh, which is uh, from from our Crypto 17 paper, <coughs> and then uh, we'll look at the more recent construction of dual regif from LBD19, and. Uh, I'll try to uh, also explain the difficulties um, caused by some of the properties we saw uh, in, in the last talk. <coughs> and then in the second application, we look at how to construct digital signatures uh, from these problems. So I'll start by looking at uh, Lubashevsky's uh, original thesis null-based construction. And then um, I'll tell you about, uh, about uh, that, pro that construction's limitations and uh, the alternative MPLWE-based construction that uh, <coughs> was published last year. And uh, we, we found some issues with it and uh, we have a, an improved version that is in submission. Um, And then I'll uh, conclude. So, <coughs> so this is just a recap of what we just discussed in the previous talk. That uh, <coughs> the goal here is to construct crypto systems that are a kind of balance, that have a balance between a low security risk uh, compared to the fixed spring PLWE mod F schemes. But on the other hand, they should have better performance than uh, unstructured or LWE-based schemes. Um, and so this is really the motivation uh, that is also underlying these applications. <coughs> okay, so let's start with public encryption. So it, what I'm going to show you is the primal regular kind of public encryption for real product LWE. Uh, that's what we call titanium. Um, 
So here's uh, the way we generate the, the keys. So if you remember how the original uh, LWE based uh, scheme works, the uh, Regex encryption scheme, then you'll know that uh, the public key consists of essentially a bunch of LWE samples. Uh, and the secret key is the LWE secret. So, uh, so we, we have a bunch of uh, AI, so this is really a direct translation of that into the middle product case. Um, we, we, we generate these random polynomials AIs. We, we're going to have T of them uh, in the public key. And we choose them at random of degree uh, n or less than n. Then um, we have uh, these uh, small errors chosen from some uh, small error distribution, uh, e. and we have a secret that here will be chosen uniformly from <coughs> n plus d plus k minus 1. So by the way, uh, when we generate these MPLWE samples, um, we we have that as in our definition of MPLWE as the middle product of the AIs and the secret plus the noise. And here the parameter that we call D before, uh, we, will, <coughs> we will have it here as D plus K. So we will use uh, D for something else. And you can see that uh, the, the dimensions are, are going to match here the A's are, uh, they have n coefficients and we are going to keep d plus k middle coefficients in the middle product uh, with s. So s has to have uh, the sum n plus d plus k minus 1 many coefficients because that's the number of columns of this circuit matrix. <coughs> Okay, but the BIs will just have D plus K coefficients. So, so the public key are the MPLW samples and the secret key is S. <coughs> now, let's say we want to encrypt the message with this public key. Again, we're going to try to, to do uh, what is done in Reagan's original LWE based thing. So we're going to take uh, some uh, small random polynomials, R1 up to RT. <coughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to take these as coefficients and take this small uh, linear combination of the AIs in the public key and call this uh, the first part of the ciphertext, U at prime. And then we'll take the same combinations of the, the BI part of the of the middle product uh, LWE samples and, uh, and uh, add them to the message basically to, to encrypt the message. And here uh, the message is going to have coefficients um, of size p <coughs> which is uh, some smaller modulus than q. And uh, we, we're, we are using messages that, are, that have d coefficients so this is what we use d for and uh, <coughs> you can see that here we use the middle product with uh, taking d coefficients, so it matches the dimension there. And here we encode the message by uh, multiplying it by, by q over p. <coughs> so this is a standard way to encrypt, but one thing that you may notice uh, that is different from uh, the original primal regular is that we use different operations of multiplication for C1 and for C2. So here is the middle product. Right here, this denotes just the usual polynomial multiplication with no uh, mod reduction and no middle product. Um, and we'll see in a minute why we have to do this. Okay, and then uh, to decrypt this type of text with the secret S, we're going to do this, so uh, we're going to take C2, subtract C1 times the secret, and again we use here a middle product, uh, and what we end up with is something that should be close to this encoded message, 
Uh, and so we, we get it by rounding off the errors from uh, multiples of Q over P, and we get the, the message. <coughs> so let's look at the correctness to see uh, how it works. So if we look at uh, what we're doing in decryption, we're doing this difference here. And uh, so remember that C2 was, um, so C2 was uh, this thing. And here we have C1 was computed like this. And it gets multiplied by, by S. <coughs> and we know, of course, that the BIs were generated as middle product LWE samples, so they look like this. And <coughs> what happens now is that we would like to uh, we would like to cancel out uh, this term with this term. Uh, it has the right terms in it, R, I, A, I, and S, to, to cancel out, but the operations look different. <coughs> but it turns out that indeed these two are equal. And what we are using here is in fact what we call the associative property of middle product, although it's, it's not quite a normal associative property because we have a different multiplication operation here. Um, but so it's a quite, you can think of it as a kind of quasi-associative property. <coughs> but the way to show that this property holds is in fact uh, a simple way to do it is to write down the, the matrix representation of these uh, operations. So if we, if we write down uh, these uh, Ris and Ais as the uh, we can write the RI as a Toiplitz matrix. Uh, remember that the middle product can be written as a Toiplitz of RI times the vector for this. And this in turn is a Toiplitz for AI times, times S. Um, and here, this normal multiplication operation is also a Toiplitz uh, with the RI being on the left as a Toiplitz of this Toiplitz of AI. And basically, if we do that, we will see that this equality comes from just the associative property of matrices, which in this case are all these coefficients matrices. <coughs> and so that's a, a simple way to, to see why this is true. <coughs> but uh, given that it's true, um, well, we can cancel out this term, and then the decryption works similar to the original regular scheme because we end up with the message plus this term here, which is the Ris uh, multiplying the Eis, and these, both the Ris and the Eis are small, so that uh, if they are significant or sufficiently smaller than Q over P, then rounding <coughs> this uh, sum to a multiple of Q over P will give us um, the message. Okay, so this is the correctness. Now let's see how we can get um, the security of the scheme. We would like to show that um, the distinguishing this ciphertext um, of uh, two different messages, given the public key, is as hard as solving the MPLWE problem. So remember that the ciphertext looks like this. It's got um, these two components, C1 and C2. <coughs> and the attacker has uh, these two ciphertexts together with the, the public key, which is these AIs and PIs, the MPLW samples. <coughs> so the first step in the proof is the same as what's done in the, in the original regular scheme. Namely, we, we change the way that we generate the, the public keys and we replace the BIs here, uh, the MPLWE samples, by just uniformly random polynomials of, of the right degree. And, of course, if the attacker can notice this difference that we, we made, then the attacker can clearly distinguish the MPLWE samples from, from uniform. 
<coughs> and so this remains indistinguishable to the attacker by the, the hardness of MPLWE that we, uh, that we discussed in the last talk. And now what we have is just uh, these random AIs and BIs. And what we would like to show is that the, this term here, this uh, sum of RIBI, is going to mask the message because it's, uh, it's going to be random. And we will have essentially a one-time pad here encryption of the message. <coughs> so we want to show that this sum is is statistically close to uniform on on uh, the set of polynomials of degree uh, of, of D coefficients, <coughs> but we have to do so uh, given that the attacker also sees the, the rest of the, uh, the basically the public key, the AIs um, and the BIs, as well as the, the C1, which is this thing, and um, <coughs> of course the C1. It also depends on the RIs, and so the C1 can reveal some of the entropy of the RIs um, and might help the attacker to, to distinguish this uh, from uniform. <coughs> now usually um, what we do at this point in, in the original Reagan encryption scheme security proof is that we apply the, the, the standard leftover hash lemma which says that Basically, the the mapping uh, the mapping that maps the this uh, small RIs to, to this sum and this sum together. And this is a kind of universal hash family, and um, the output of that universal hash function uh, will be uniform, will be statistically close to uniform as long as the RIs have enough entropy. <coughs> Uh, but in this case, it turns out it, it's not uh, immediately straightforward as like this because <coughs> it turns out that this uh, universal hash argument does not quite work directly. And we have to use what's known as the generalized leftover hash lemma um, to, uh, to handle this. So let, let me um, tell you a little bit more about this. <coughs> So, what happens is that uh, if we look at these uh, two components, then uh, due to the, remember that here we are using the, the normal polynomial multiplication, not the middle product, and we already saw that um, when we looked at this inhomogeneous uh, thesis problem, we said that, uh, for example, the constant coefficient of of this uh, sum here depends only on the constant coefficients of the RIs and not all the other coefficients. <coughs> and uh, because of this issue, in fact, C1, the distribution of C1 conditioned on the AIs is not uh, so close to uniform as, as it is in the standard uh, scenario of the leftover hash. So we cannot uh, apply this. Uh, this method directly, and what we need instead is this general leftover hash, which says that we only look at the uh, uniformity of this component, the C2. So here, it's actually a good type of operation, this, this uh, middle product. <coughs> uh, and it does give us a universal uh, hash family. <coughs> And what we do is we treat this component here as a kind of leakage of entropy on the RIs. And the general uh, leftover hash lemma says that uh, if you just re regard this as your uh, universal hash operation that maps the RIs to, to this, then this will look uniform um, as long as this part doesn't leak too much entropy. <coughs> Um, and so that's the, the kind of uh, approach we take here. <coughs> so we don't show the uniformity of this, we just show this one is uniform condition on this. And so to do this we just need to show that this mapping uh, on this side is a universal hash. And what this means basically is that 
the probability over the choice of the bi's at random that we get a zero output for a non-zero r um, should be the same for, for any value of r and uh, should correspond to a uniform distribution of this. So, it turns out that this is not that uh, difficult to show using the fact that um, the, if the Ri's are non-zero, or if one of them is non-zero, then the Totlitz matrix um, for that Ri will have a diagonal that is all non-zero, and that covers all of the, the D rows of the of this uh, matrix, and it means that this matrix is full rank, and we get this uh, this universal hash property. So, using the general leftover hash lemma, we can conclude that uh, we have this uh, statistically close distribution as long as the RIs have enough entropy conditioned on on this, which means that uh, we have to. Uh, compensate for the loss of entropy of C1, and it corresponds to, to having enough uh, samples, enough of these AIs in the public key um, to deal with this leakage. <coughs> so here, in this equation, uh, delta here is the statistical distance between C2 and uniform that we want to achieve, and um, the BLHL here is the entropy of each coordinate of these Ri's. <coughs> so, so one question uh, uh, that you may ask here is, is why we haven't used the standard uh, LHL. And I've, I've given uh, essentially the answer with, uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. It's basically because uh, C1 is not uh, uniform condition on the AIs. And uh, as I mentioned, this is because this mapping with the normal multiplication operation is not universal. And in fact, um, you can look at it this way. If you look at the constant coefficient of C1 uh, written in terms of the, the RIs and AIs constant coefficients, <coughs> if uh, if these p constant coefficients here are all happen to be zero, which happens with probability one over q to the t for random AIs, then we will always have the, the constant coordinate of C1 being zero with probability one for, for this uh, conditional of the AIs. So this is a kind of bias of one over q to the t in the distribution of C1 and when t is small, which again is the case of interest in most applications, we get a non-individual bias on this distribution. So uh, that's not good. Uh, although, as, as I said, we have a way of uh, getting around it by using this general generalized leftover hash lemma. So the security proof of this scheme can still go through, but um, yeah we don't get the deformity of C1. So for this application, it's not too bad because C1 is, uh, is not really need, doesn't need to be uniform for security. But um, if we look at efficiency, then the kind of number of samples that we need to use in order to satisfy that entropy condition, um, well, it, uh, although asymptotically it's uh, only logarithmic in the security parameter, and so if we set parameters like this, asymptotically we can get encryption, um, decryption time to be quasi-linear in the security parameter lambda. And uh, we can get the length of the keys and ciphertext also quasi-linear in lambda. So that's very good because asymptotically it's uh, up to log factors it's the same as uh, the standard uh, efficient mod F ring LWE uh, encryption schemes. <coughs> but in practice, these log factors do matter. And we need in practice, if we choose concrete parameters, the, the number of samples of, in the public need to be uh, at least something like 10. 
and this you can compare to just one sample for for the fixed edge scheme. So there is a, a non-negligible overhead um, in the size of the public key in this scheme. And that's one of the main uh, drawbacks in this scheme. Uh, also, the, the modulus Q that we, we need to use is larger because when we have more samples, more T, then this uh, error term that we need to make small enough compared to Q when we do the decryption, so I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about this error term here, when T is larger then also uh, this, this term grows and we need to use a larger Q in order to make decryption correctness work. So this uh, application of this statistical left over hash generalized left over hash has some overheads. And so it would be very nice if we could uh, reduce this overhead using a computational left over hash, just like in, uh, is done in PLWE mod F schemes, uh, in order to use a very small number of samples in the public key. <coughs> and so you may ask, why don't we just do this with PLWE, but the answer is actually uh, in the previous talk because we saw that uh, we don't have such a computational hardness. Uh, so if we use, uh, uh, we said last in the in the last talk that if we use small RIs here uh, with with uh, not much entropy, so that uh, this uh, C1 determines the RIs uniquely, then they can be easily computed efficiently from, from C1 and so we, we get an insecure uh, problem. So, so really we don't know how to, to improve this, uh, um, this large number of public key samples and that's a very interesting question for, for future work on this uh, problem. So <coughs> despite this, uh, when we uh, design this uh, titanium scheme, we we kind of uh, did our best to optimize the scheme and squeeze the, the parameters as much as we could given these uh, constraints. And we also tried to, to improve the computation uh, efficiency of, of our algorithms. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about those here. Um, so in order to get this fast uh, arithmetic for doing the middle product operation, we, we wanted to, to use uh, fast uh, NTT-based or Fourier transform kind of approaches to get a quasi-linear running time. <coughs> uh, now, uh, a generic way to do it is to uh, just do a normal polynomial multiplication and then throw out some of the coefficients um, in order to compute the middle product. And, and even for normal polynomial multiplication, we can just do NTT-based arithmetic. So that's already quite fast. But it turns out that we can do better than this. And the research in uh, computer algebra many years ago has already um, derived some uh, optimized variant of, of the number theoretic transform class multiplication to, to compute middle products more efficiently than this uh, generic method I, I just mentioned. And so we actually adopted those and optimized them uh, further um, in order to, to get the fast computation of the scheme. <coughs> so essentially, uh, the way that uh, these uh, algorithms work is uh, similar to, to other rtt based algorithms and in order to do a, a middle product of A and B, it involves doing uh, a number theoretic transform of A and B separately and doing a pointwise multiplication followed by a, an inverse transform. And then there is a truncation, so in some sense there is still this kind of uh, approach of uh, 
and doing a normal multiplication followed by truncation, but it's, uh, the dimensions are smaller than what the generic method would have. <coughs> and we also used some, uh, some other optimizations of the NTT algorithms to speed it up. So, for example, all these uh, uh, zero paddings that we need to do on these polynomials to, to pad them to the right dimensions, and, and some of this truncation that we do on the output, uh, these things can, uh, can be exploited in practice to speed things up. And so, <coughs> um, the other things that we did are also to, to, speed the, uh, to speed up these entity algorithms. We used an approach that is uh, similar to what's used in <coughs> module algebra schemes. Uh, so the approach there in the schemes, for example, like Kyber, is to implement a very fast uh, entity for a fixed dimension, like 256, and then uh, use it as a subroutine to, uh, uh, to work with, with dimensions that are multiples of 256. <coughs> And it turns out we can do a, a similar thing for middle product, and uh, that's, uh, that's what we did. So we, we also use a, a 256 dimension subroutine for RTT, <coughs> and what we did is we chose our, uh, our dimensions so that they are close to multiples of 256, and we chose our, our modulus cube to be what's called RTT friendly, meaning that uh, Q minus 1 has the, the right divisors that are multiples of 256. <coughs> so that we can apply uh, this entity. <coughs> and some other optimizations that we did were to do things like pre computing the public key uh, transform when we do the keygen so that we can save that uh, operation during encryption and decryption. And we also use the fact that our secret key is uniform so that um, the NTT transform of, of the uniform is another uniform element and so effectively we can sample directly the secret key in the NTT domain. <coughs> so these are some uh, optimizations we did and we also did a constant time implementation so this was all done uh, as part of our NIST submission um, and but for, our, for our distributions, I'll tell you a little bit what we chose. So, <coughs> as I said, we used uh, uniformly distributed secret keys. For the randomness, we used uh, uniformly random small uh, integers. And, um, <coughs> and for the error distributions, we used uh, the binomial difference distribution, so this is quite commonly used in lattice-based cryptography. <coughs> and for the decryption error probability, we set it to be uh, moderately low for, for our CPI scheme and negligible for our CCI scheme. So just to give you an idea, these are the parameters that we, we had for different security levels. So this is the 128 bit security level. And we had, uh, so this is the dimension of the AIs in the public key. <coughs> and uh, this is the dimension of the randomness. And this is the dimension of the message. And you see that the number of samples we have in the public keys are in the order of 10. Um, okay, um, so this is the parameters for CCA. And just to show you um, some of the <coughs> Just to show you some of the performance figures that we got in comparison with other uh, lattice-based schemes. So what I have in the middle row here is, is our uh, middle product-based scheme. And you can see uh, on the top here the parameters for the Kyber scheme, which is based on fixed string uh, module PLWE. And so this is the, the higher risk alternative, and here we have the lower risk alternative, the rebase, which is Frodo. And you can see that uh, 
most of our parameters fit in between these two extremes. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the ciphertext that we have, uh, this is in <coughs> this is in bytes, uh, is between the 800 and uh, 9000. And similarly, for encryption and, and other running times, they are also uh, kind of as a geometric mean of the, the two extremes. So it, I think this kind of shows that we have this kind of balance in our speed. Uh, although, in terms of public key size, uh, we're actually even higher than, than Frodo. So this, was, this is the main disadvantage, which I, due to the problem I mentioned before with the leftover hash dilemma, the statistical one. So improving this would be very interesting. <coughs> Okay, so let me move on to uh, another approach to make uh, public encryption at the LWE. So this was uh, done by Lombardi et al. in TCC this year. So the, the main idea is to uh, try to construct the dual ranked uh, PKE that is originally from GPV08 in the LWE setting. <coughs> and try to adapt this one to a POWE. And in fact, they even go on and, and show how to extend this scheme into an identity-based encryption scheme. Um, and, uh, but I won't, uh, I won't discuss this part. But I want to show you some of the techniques that they used and uh, also the, the limitations uh, that maybe are interesting for future work. So, <coughs> So the basic approach of uh, dual regular is to kind of reverse the key generation and encryption operations. So in keygen, um, we're going to do a, a, an operation like this uh, linear combination with small ris that we did previously in the encryption. And here the ris will be the, uh, the secret key. Uh, and u will be part of the public key together with the A's. And then when we encrypt, we're going to generate the LWE sample, the, M, the MPLWE samples uh, by choosing an S and small EIs. And in addition to these uh, BIs in the ciphertext, we'll also produce one more sample C, which will be used to actually encrypt the message. <coughs> um, so this, uh, the randomness used here will be the, this U that we had in the public key. And um, then when we decrypt, we, we uh, subtract out, so this is similar to what we did uh, in the final scheme. <coughs> so there are two kind of uh, main ingredients in the security analysis of this scheme. Um, the first one is uh, another kind of leftover hash lemma. Um, and so, essentially, what happens here is that um, in this kind of application where this uh, sum of RIAI that previously was in the ciphertext, now it's in the, uh, it's, it's in the public key, it's actually this U. Um, so this, uh, this thing, the first part in the, in the proof of this scheme is to show that this is indistinguishable from uniform because later on this U serves as, uh, as the randomness in an MPLWE sample and we really need it to be uniform uh, to, to show that this is a hard MPLWE problem. And uh, so we cannot get around uh, not showing that this is uniform as we did in the, the primal scheme that before. And so in LBB, they actually show a kind of limited or weak type of leftover hash lemma for, for this. And effectively, the, the statistical distance to uniformity for C1, conditioned on the, the AIs, what they get is actually kind of reminiscent of the 1 over 2 to the T bias that, that we saw before. Uh, we discussed before, it's, it's in fact even bigger than this because uh, instead of having a Q here, we have a, 
2 to the B, where B is the, the entropy of the Ri's. So, <coughs> what it means is that um, when T is small, um, when the number of samples is small, then this uh, distance to uniformity is uh, non negligible And um, that means, effectively, that uh, the, the security proof in LBV only rules out attacks with uh, advantage that are bigger than this uh, kind of relatively small quantity. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, something that is... Um, uh, sorry, this should have been a, a log lambda. So it's something that is sub-exponential in lambda instead of exponential. Um, so that's what uh, a limitation that would be very interesting to, to improve. <coughs> but um, once you have this, um, if you make this assumption that you are only interested in attacks with a large enough advantage, then uh, you can replace u by a uniform, and the remaining of the proof is effectively applying MPLWE hardness to, uh, to this instance. The eyes together with the C. There is some other difficulty that is overcome in LDP here. It's because they need a variant which they call parameterized degree MPLWE. That means that it's MPLWE where the AIs can have different degrees, but the secret always uh, is just one secret with a fixed degree. Uh, and they show how to generalize our hardness reduction for MPLWE to this parameterized case. Okay, so that's what um, I'll say about encryption. So let me now tell you a bit about uh, the signatures that uh, can be built for MPLWE. <coughs> um, so this is a, an upcoming work uh, in which we uh, show a, a reduction from small secret PLWE uh, to small secret MPLWE for, for many F. So this is what I've discussed in my previous scope. Uh, and then we show an application to a signature scheme based on the small secret variant of MPLWE. Um, but maybe before this, uh, let's just review uh, some background. Uh, so this is the standard notation for signatures. Maybe I won't spend too much on this, but um, uh, we have the, the standard properties of signatures. If a message is signed with a secret key, it should be verifiable with a public key. And for security, we want that um, even if you can see many signatures, it's hard to produce a signature on a new message. So let me first show you how Dubashevsky did a signature based on the PCS null problem. So this signature is constructed in the random oracle model based on the Fiat Chamir um, approach. So the Fiat Chamir approach is so in uh, previous talks in this uh, workshop, it starts with a, a kind of interactive protocol and then converts it to, to non-interactive by replacing the challenge by, by a hash of the message and, uh, and, this, mes and this commitment. <coughs> uh, so we're going to uh, Lubashevsky's uh, scheme is based on this uh, approach uh, and as we saw uh, in Vadim's talk, uh, a famous example of this is the Schnorr signature scheme in the district log setting. Um, and so, um, once we have such a, a protocol, if the, if the interactive protocol, uh, identification protocol, is, has, the, has the, the right security properties, then when we transform it, a signature by uh, <coughs> by generating the challenge as a hash of the message and commitment message, then we get a, a secure signature scheme. Yeah. So, so in fact, uh, 
there are uh, classical results that uh, allow you to do this in the random oracle model. And uh, the basic idea uh, is to start with an identification scheme that uh, satisfies this, uh, what's known as special soundness. So that means that, um, so that's uh, actually known from a long time before this paper, but uh, that's the classical fiat Chavier forking approach. So basically, if you have two uh, accepting uh, transcripts of the identification protocol with different challenges, but with the same commitment, then there should be an efficient uh, algorithm or extractor to extract a solution to some hard computational problem. <coughs> of course, also we need some kind of uh, simulatability or zero knowledge condition, uh, but I won't focus on it too much because uh, it was discussed uh, at length by, by Levine. So, <coughs> So here's the scheme of uh, the Berlin scheme based on uh, this is now. And effectively what it does is it uh, uses the thesis problem to generate the, the keys. So uh, the public key is in fact an instance of the, this inhomogeneous thesis null problem that we uh, discussed before. And, and then the uh, signature scheme uh, <coughs> uses the same inhomogeneous problem to commit to some random YIs. And then, after the challenge is set, the response is the standard Schnorr approach and modified uh, to, to achieve zero knowledge uh, using the standard rejection sampling technique. <coughs> uh, yeah, in fact, the original scheme in the Wachowski uh, 16 was uh, using Gaussians, uh, uh, but we can also use uh, a simpler method as we did discuss. Uh, and then verification checks the relation of this form. Uh, <coughs> okay, and the, the idea of, of doing the, the special soundness proof is that if you have two transcripts, so this is also uh, very similar to what we discussed in this talk, <coughs> you get a relation of this form if you subtract the verification relations. And you can see that uh, these, <coughs> these differences here constitute a, a solution to the inhomogeneous uh, thesis null problem. Um, and as long as the ZIs uh, are small and the challenges are small, then we get a, a solution. And <coughs> so to show that this uh, is a hard computational problem, uh, the approach was to, to show a reduction uh, from, the, uh, <coughs> from the thesis null problem. And this is what we discussed in the previous talk. So here, in order for that reduction to show the hardness, we need a secret that is sufficiently large. And so, <coughs> uh, so the problem with this uh, scheme is that because of this condition, the secret key coordinates are relatively large, and that makes the, the Zs also even larger, and it, it leads to, to quite long signatures. Um, and so again, here, we may be tempted to use short secret coordinates to reduce the feeling to length. But as I mentioned in, in, in my previous talk, we then bump into the insecure variant of inhomogeneous uh, pieces. So we cannot securely use this scheme with short secrets and short signatures. So this is again the this limitation of the, the pieces null problem. And so in order to uh, get shorter signatures, we uh, worked on um, MPLWE based signatures, and there was a, uh, a previous work published last year <coughs> by uh, one of my co authors, uh, 
Rio your master that uh, uses a similar approach. <coughs> um, in fact, another kind of goal that we wanted to achieve is to uh, achieve security in the theorem or quantum random oracle model uh, and still have a tight security proof. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this work <coughs> by Hiltz et al. from last year showed that one approach to get such a, a scheme um, is to start with an identification scheme that satisfies these properties here. <coughs> so, um, the first one is, uh, or the first two, in fact, are uh, known as the kind of uh, lossy properties of the identification scheme. And what it means is that you should use in your identification scheme a public key that is hard to distinguish from uniform. And <coughs> if you replace the public key by a uniform one, then it becomes uh, essentially information theoretically uh, hard to, to impersonate in this case. Um, and it also requires some entropy condition on the commitments. <coughs> My nice thing is that if you have such a, an ID scheme satisfying these properties, you can get a tight security reduction in the theorem for your signature that you get out of it. So here's our MPLW version of, of the Schnorr scheme. Um, and we use this approach on the previous slide to, to analyze it. So you can see that we have used the, in the key gen now, when we generate keys, we, we uh, generate MPLW samples. And we also use the, the small secret variant of MPLW. Um, so the reason is that when we do the signatures, uh, so we commit with uh, also the, the middle product operation and we respond to the challenge with the middle product multiplication by the secret. And here, these z's have to be short in order to make the, uh, the problem hard. And uh, that means that we need to use small secrets um, in our LWE, LWE. So this is what led us to uh, to show the hardness of, of small secrets and the other <coughs> um, Okay, so we obtain our signature by applying the Fletcher Mirkins form to this uh, ID scheme. And at the same time, we also fix uh, uh, a bug in the analysis of the, the original scheme of. Uh, uh, of proof set last year. So it turns out that this scheme was similar to, to the scheme I just showed you, except that um, in that scheme it was applying some extra optimizations. Um, so these are optimizations that are also shown in this uh, paper that are also used in the dilithium signature, uh, where the, they use the essentially this compression or the, the by um, uh, the by Galbraith compression technique to, to shorten the, the coordinates to, to throw out some uh, uh, significant bits of the signature. Uh, now it turns out that um, if you do this kind of optimizations, uh, this compression of signatures, then you have to be very careful in the security analysis and what we need uh, is, when we translate it to, to our scheme, is that uh, you need that this middle product of A and Y, when you do the commitment, is, uh, <coughs> is uniformly random uh, with respect to the choice of A. Uh, but it turns out that um, it's not necessarily the case uh, for some Ys. Because uh, yeah, if the if the rank of the so 
associate that the uh, matrix, this complex matrix is, uh, is low, then this will not hold. The, the entropy of this quantity will be much smaller. <coughs> so this was a bug in the analysis uh, uh, of the last year's uh, signature scheme, which we, we overcome. And the way we overcome it is to remove this uh, kind of optimizations, this compression optimizations, and it would be interesting also to, to find a, a, a way to still use these optimizations uh, and, uh, and have a, a security proof, but we don't know yet how to do it. So, <coughs> uh, just to show you an example of the, the concrete parameters that we get for our skin, uh, they look something like this. Um, and you'll notice that uh, our modulus Q is, is quite big. Um, and this is one of the disadvantages of our scheme. Although our signatures are, uh, are shorter, um, so they're actually shorter than the Bashevsky scheme. Um, I thought I had a comparison. So here's a comparison of our scheme to the Lashevsky's one, you can see the signature size is, uh, is much shorter, but on the other hand, our public key is longer. So it's a kind of trade-off. And the main reason why our uh, signatures, uh, sorry, the main reason why our public key is longer is that we have this very large modulus Q in order to satisfy that lossiness condition uh, in the security analysis, which are talk more about it now, but uh, the, the reason why we get a shorter signature is that we can use uh, this, uh, the small secret MPLWE problem, which we, we have a hardness result for, uh, whereas this team cannot use small secrets. Uh, so let me just uh, go back a bit and tell you a little bit about why we have such a large modulus, uh, because um, so essentially, what happens is that, um, remember that we're going to use that conversion of an identity scheme into a signature, and we use this uh, lossiness approach, which means that we need the public key to be, um, if, if the public key is uniformly random, then we want that statistically, with high probability, there is, it's not possible to, to, to find a forgery or an impersonation in this uh, scheme. <coughs> so, in order to, to show these uh, properties, first of all, to show that the public key is indistinguishable from uniform, it's not a uh, problem for us because we have shown the hardness of small secret uh, MPLWE, and that immediately gives us that the public key samples are uh, indistinguishable from uniform. But the other requirement is more trouble, troublesome because it requires us to, to bound a probability that looks something like this. So here, B is the public key that we replace by uniform uh, in this step. And what we want is that when B is uniform, it's hard, or uh, we want to upper bound the probability that there is short Z1 and Z2 um, such that this can be uh, satisfied. So here, the, the W corresponds to a value that is chosen by the attacker. This is the commitment that the attacker queries to the hash function. And this can depend on, on B and A. But then a random challenge C is chosen, and we are asking whether um, there are small Z1 and Z2 that satisfy this condition. So it's effectively uh, a variant of the inhomogeneous uh, MPCs problem that I uh, discussed at the end of, of the last talk. And what we said there is that if we choose um, the parameters appropriately, or <coughs> uh, effectively, if Q is big enough, then 
this probability will be negligible. Uh, and so that's what we, we have to, to show. Uh, and effectively, it boils down to uh, doing a kind of union bound. And, uh, and if we do this union bound over all small values of the parameters, uh, maybe I won't go through the, the full details, but what we get is that this probability uh, is bounded, upper bounded by something like this. And uh, if we can, if we make Q big enough, we can make it negligible. But uh, in order to do so, it turns out that Q needs to be uh, quite big, as you saw in the, in the concrete parameters. It needs to be uh, something like 2 to the 90 for this lossiness condition. <coughs> and because of this large Q, we get this long, long public keys. And so again, you might ask, oh, why not? Uh, uh, why are we using this lossiness? Why not uh, use a shorter queue and use some kind of computational argument on the hardness of the inhomogeneous NPCs? But then we run into again the, the insecure region of parameters. So um, if we use Q that is too small, so really this lossiness condition is not only needed. Uh, just for the proof, it's actually uh, to avoid this kind of insecurity that we discussed uh, last time. Although there is still a gap between the conditions, but definitely uh, Q needs to be big enough. So this is a, a uh, just uh, this table shows the trade-off that we get between uh, using MPLWE and PCs, but each of them have uh, good and bad points. Um, and it would be interesting uh, to find uh, a solution that has the best of both. <coughs> so just as a summary, uh, we've shown how to construct uh, uh, some basic uh, primitives from uh, MPLW and PCs and now. Um, and even recently, some more advanced primitives like identity-based encryption were constructed, but with limited uh, security guarantees. <coughs> and although these schemes uh, achieve this risk performance balance, um, they do have some unpleasant properties, uh, these problems that limit the efficiency of the construction. And so it would be nice to, uh, to improve on this. And uh, uh, so, having uh, having more efficient schemes uh, and uh, constructing even more powerful crypto primitives that uh, that avoid this uh, kind of weak uh, leftover hash lemma uh, assumptions that uh, that we discussed for the the dual regex scheme. Uh, would be very nice, or even uh, how to, to construct public encryption without a statistical leftover hash lemma based on MPLW uh, is a very interesting question. <coughs> so uh, I think that brings me to the end. So thank you very much.